The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. It is Monday, December 23rd, 2019. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live to tape steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, we're nearing the end of the year and arguably the end of the decade. We've gotten a lot of emails about the the question as to whether we are ending the the decade or in fact the decade ends in 2021. Nevertheless, we have ended our work year. That's right. It's one of our famous best ofs. Why is it famous? Well, sometimes you convince yourself that things are famous and that way you can justify taking a couple of days off for vacation. Because we're giving you something famous, more famous than the actual show itself, but rather a repeat of the show. Voted by you. I'm specifically talking about one person voted for this show and you know who you are. And congratulations. Because today, we have How to Hide an Empire, a history of the greater United States with Daniel Imawar. He is an associate professor of history at Northwestern University and a fascinating book about the, um, about, uh, uh, well, basically how an empire is hidden in some respects uh, in the, uh, I mean, I don't know how else... uh, to, I don't want no spoiler alerts here. No spoiler alerts here. Michael's uh, Michael's here with us in spirit, but not on microphone. Um, uh, folks, Andrew it, Yang of Show Plug. There you go. I don't know what that means. You don't know the Medicare joke? No. Uh, the uh, the Medicare I don't. Medicare for all joke. Medicare for all joke. All right. There you go, folks. See that we're already on vacation. See how loose we are. Um, uh, folks, we're on vacation all this week, and uh, I will tell you that I will probably hop on YouTube if any big news happens uh, this week. Also, the AM Quickie is live. We're doing it. AMQuickie.com. Sign up there. This week, we're going to be a little loosey-goosey on it. I think we're going to may try a couple of different things just because um, we don't have our normal production uh, regimen. And we may spice some stuff up. And then uh, when we come back in the new year, maybe we'll integrate some of what we use. Not sure. Really don't know. We're playing this all by the seat of our pants. Uh, everyone in the office was pretty frazzled by the uh, by by uh, the end of this year. I imagine you are as well. I hope you are taking some time for some self care. In other words, uh, if you are one of those people who uh, drinks alcohol, that you're doing that. Or if you like to exercise, God forbid, uh, you're doing that as well. Whatever it takes. Uh, so enjoy this. Uh, we will have a uh, show every day this week except for Christmas because, you know, it's Christmas and come on. So uh, How to Hide an Empire, A History of the Greater United States with Daniel Immerwar. Um, Don't forget, you can support this show by becoming a member at jointhemajorityreport.com and uh, we have fun half stuff don't know what it is it'll be we got a whole cavalcade of fun half stuff that'll be happening and are we going to make these freebies yeah we probably should right freebie mondays this is our our christmas and hanukkah present present to you oh also happy hanukkah because <laughs> uh last night was the first night of hanukkah so all right we're going to take a quick break and uh when we come back daniel Imwar, and this was first from tuesday april 30th 2019 How to Hide an Empire, a History of the Greater United States. Daniel Imavar, uh, author of How to Hide an Empire, a History of the Greater United States. Uh, Daniel, welcome to the program. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, All right. So let's uh, just uh, as an overview, this is a a almost like a geographic history of of the of the empire of the United States. Why, what, what, I guess, what, what is it about knowing the geography as you track it over the course of, of, of a couple hundred years uh, that is so important to our understanding of, of America as 
um, as an entity, I guess. Yeah, no, that's right. Um, I, I start the book with maps, and one of the reasons I do that is that, frankly, I think a lot of people in the United States and a lot of people outside of the United States don't really have an accurate map of the full borders of the country in their head. So, you know, if you ask most people, what does the U.S. look like on a map? They call to mind that familiar shape, um, just the contiguous blob with Mexico and uh, uh, Canada on the north and south and the oceans on either side. Uh, but the thing is, those have only been the borders of the United States for three years of its history. There's three years of U.S. history where those are the borders, partly because in the 18th and early 19th century, the United States was expanding. Uh, but because after it stopped sort of expanding in the contiguous North America, it started expanding overseas, taking first uninhabited islands in the Caribbean and the Pacific, in the Caribbean and the Pacific, uh, and then you know taking large inhabited colonies. By the end of the 19th century, it had a, a very large and populous empire, and those overseas parts of the United States, both the colonies and then later on the military bases, uh, hundreds of them that the United States claims, those are I think just don't really feature in most people's maps of the country, and as a result, they tell a truncated version of its history, a history that only is interested and only focuses on the mainland, and they miss a lot of the action when they do that. And does it, and, and, and do we also, um, does it have implications in terms of the character of, of the country? I mean, uh, that, that we don't fully grasp the history, but do we not fully grasp, you know, I guess the I don't know. I'm just thinking, you know, we're we're obviously it's primary season. And so uh, we have a lot of candidates who talk about America as an idea. Uh, and yeah. I'm not sure I 100 percent know what that means. But um, yeah, does it implicate that idea? I think it does, um, because the vision that you get of the United States, if you're just looking at what people in the territories call the mainland, uh, first of all, it's a vision where uh, Republican ideals hold not perfectly, but fairly well. Most people live in parts of the United States that allow them to vote, that allow them to have um, sort of vote vote for representatives in Congress. Now, that's not true in D.C., uh, so there are some little uh, an anomalies, and, and um, Native American lands have their own sort of legal arrangements. Um, nevertheless, you kind of feel like it's wall-to-wall -wall carpeting in terms of the Republican system. Uh, once you look at the other parts of the United States, uh, the overseas parts, you realize that a big, a big part of U.S. history uh, is, is, is a peripheral zone, a zone that is, uh, doesn't have uh, representation in terms of the ability to uh, vote for the president, uh, doesn't have the ability to vote for delegates who then have voting power in Congress, and in many cases isn't even covered by the Constitution. Uh, so that's disenfranchisement or subordination by all three modes of government. And that is, I think, a serious cognitive dissonance or contradiction between the ideals of the country as we often articulate them and the ideals as they're actually lived. Uh, I mean, I guess, and as we go through these sort of uh, these these eras, I mean, do we have a an accounting of, particularly in that respect, of the, uh, of, of the numbers that we're talking about? I mean, how does that translate in, from... And at, at, at maybe high and low points in terms of just how many of those uh, of of people are in that sort of um, that uh, that area of they're not sovereign, but they're not in any way represented. Sure. Uh, so we're at a relative low point right now. Uh, in you know, the United States still has five inhabited territories, and between three and four million people live in them. If you add Washington, D.C., that's, uh, you know, a few more hundred thousand people uh, without full representation, uh, the, the kind that uh, citizens living in states have. Um, but, you know, that's a relatively low point. Um, if you go back to 1940, uh, which is where I sort of open the book um, as I tell the story of how World War II comes to the territories. Uh, at that time, 19 million people who live in the United States, 19 million people who are U.S. nationals live off the mainland outside of the states. And just for some perspective, uh, if you live in the United States, then there's a one in eight chance that you're colonized, that you live in the territories, uh, which means that you're more likely to be colonized than you are to be an immigrant. You're more likely to be colonized than you are to be African-American by odds of three to two. So this has been, at various points, a very substantial part of the United States' population. And even at times when, um, even or even in places where the populations are kind of low, small islands, military bases, which are relatively small enclaves, um, those spaces 
have also been really important to U.S. history um, beyond the, their effects of the people who live in them or right around them. Now, I want to I want to start with, um, with, uh, with 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 Pearl Harbor and 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 the the story you tell about uh, FDR and the way that he was sort of framing this for the for the estates. But it, it occurs to me as you're saying that about that sort of the really stunning number of people who are you know I mean disenfranchised is almost like um, an underwhelming word in that context. When we add that with uh, with slavery, which where you had people obviously in um, in you know m- probably material uh, situations, uh, perhaps even more oppressed. But certainly, um, the number of w- we have had in a an expansive history of having um, dominion or control over people without their having any participation in what we perceive as the idea of America. That has been sort of more the norm than not. Yeah, well, certainly it's been throughout U.S. history. Every you know day of U.S. history, um, there's some, you know there's some version of this going on. You can find some moment when uh, the promises made turn out to be restricted to you know in the 18th and 19th century to a white settler population rather than to the full population of all the land in North America, which includes Native Americans, which includes enslaved African Americans. Uh, yeah, and but what's really important to recognize, I think, is that colonialism is one of those important accesses of subordination. Actually, it's a really big one. Um, and so when we're talking about the ways in which people are disenfranchised or legally subordinated or sort of they don't count uh, within the, um, you know, the sort of sense of Washington of, of who matters and who doesn't, uh, actually colonialism is, 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 a, is a fairly big chunk of that uh, and certainly is so, especially in the first half of the 20th century. So let's talk about um, uh, the the attack on on Pearl Harbor, which in fact, I mean, oh, yeah, please. well, I mean, you, you may, I, you know, I, I, I just found the whole thing sort of fascinating because I have always referred to it as the attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, when in fact, in some respects, um, it was from, in terms of the war, it was not, it doesn't have the same relevance in terms of like, like uh, the, as all the other attacks that took place that day. Um, but, but we don't have that in our consciousness because of the way, because of, I guess, what, uh, the consciousness that Americans had of what constituted our territories at that time. Explain that. Yeah. So Pearl Harbor is not really the best name for what happened. And the reason it's not the best name for what happened is that, uh, the attack began for the United States with an attack on the naval base uh, Pearl Harbor in the territory of Hawaii, but it didn't stop there. Uh, in a near simultaneous attack, this all took place within hours. Uh, it's a little confusing because part of the attack took place on the other side of the international date line, and therefore it happened on December 8th, but this is all happening within a single, single solar day. Um, the J- Japan attacks uh, of the U.S. territories, Hawaii, Wake Island, which is an... Uh, not indigenously inhabited, but nevertheless occupied territory, Guam, and the single largest territory that the United States had ever held, which is the Philippines. And the the reason that Pearl Harbor is not a particularly great descriptor for all of that uh, is, first of all, it's not clear that that's even where the greatest military damage is done. The uh, damage to the Philippines is quite serious and takes out uh, the sort of pillar of air defense in the entire Pacific. But more importantly, The attack on Pearl Harbor is just an attack, whereas the attack on Guam, Wake Island, the Philippines, and then later Alaska, this wasn't in that day, but it happened, you know, within months, uh, was uh, a Japanese attack followed by more attacks, followed by invasion and occupation. And so, uh, you know, the largest colony that the United States had ever held, the Philippines, was occupied by Japan for years. It was a brutal occupation. And folks in the Philippines had a very different kind of war than people in Hawaii had. In, in, in fact, uh, by the end of, of World War II, Philippines had lost, what was it, 1.5 million people? or, 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 or 1.6. 1. 1. Okay, so it depends on how you count. If you're asking how many Filipinos died in the Second World World War, the government count is around 1.1 million. Uh, if you ask how many people died in the Philippines, and that so includes Japanese and that includes um, U.S. mainland service members, uh, then it goes up to 1.6 million. Uh, but just to clarify, that makes World War II in the Philippines the bloodiest event that ever took place on U.S. soil. 
That's two civil wars. And yet you rarely hear about this in U.S. history textbooks because the kind of U.S. history uh, that we often do and teach in this country is a history of not the entire United States. It's a history of the mainland only. And so things that take place outside of the mainland don't seem to count as part of that history. And, and talk about how FDR addressed the country, the, uh, the United States, I guess the, the uh, Americans, in, in in sort of framing what happened on that day. And like, you know, I guess the question I have as you explain it is, um, is it simply because like, oh, this is not a teachable moment to explain um, how we've been, you know, how many territories we have, or is it that um, like, this is not the vision that we have of ourselves. And so we don't, I don't want to really push that at this moment. Yes. Yeah, so FDR faces a really interesting choice. And in fact, not just FDR, anyone who's describing the attack, the attack that we now call Pearl Harbor, uh, in, in those, you know, hours and days after it is facing an interesting question, which is how to describe what happened. And we've got a term for it. Pearl Harbor. But they didn't have that term. Uh, that was the name of the military base, the naval base. But no one called the full attack Pearl Harbor in the way that we did. That didn't come out for a few days. So you can just go through the newspaper headlines and see editors try to put a descriptor to it or try to put a name to it or try to say what happened. And often they would say that, well, a lot of things happened. Japan attacked Hawaii and Guam or Japan attacked the Philippines and Hawaii. It wasn't clear where the focus needed to be. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt gave a speech the night before, uh, so before FDR's date, which will live in infamy speech, and she focused attention on Hawaii and the Philippines. And that's also how uh, the draft of FDR's uh, uh, famous speech went. Uh, FDR produced that draft, and it was about Japanese attacks on Hawaii and the Philippines. And then you can just see FDR noodling with the draft. And when I say you can see it, I mean literally, because we actually have his marked up successive copies and his emendations and his deletions. And uh, one thing he does is he takes out prominent references to the Philippines. He makes this a story about Hawaii. There's still a sort of back... Uh, back page reference to the Philippines. Um, people don't always remember in that speech there. FDR gives a list of other places that Japan has attacked. It's an indiscriminate list, so it doesn't distinguish in any way between U.S. and foreign territory, and it's sort of tucked to the back of the speech. But nevertheless, the focus of that is on Hawaii, and it seems pretty clear to me why. I don't think F this is a sort of grand conspiracy, but I think what FDR is responding to is that there is very little support on the U.S. mainland for a military defense of the Philippines, which is uh, has a very small white population, is very far from the mainland, or for Guam. And there's more support, although even that is kind of wobbly, uh, for to, to uh, use the U.S. military to defend the territory of Hawaii, which has a larger, although not majority, white population. Uh, and you can see FDR worry about even Hawaii because the final uh, – edit he makes to the speech between the last draft that we have on paper and his, his actual spoken speech is that he, he inserts the word American in there before he describes the target in Hawaii just to really underscore to his audience, and I think FDR was nervous about what his audience would hear, uh, that Hawaii might sound foreign, might feel foreign, but actually is American territory and therefore a Japanese attack on it is a cause for war. So, all right, so let's go back and... and what 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 is the genesis of i mean the, i guess the genesis of um of the american empire begins as uh, uh the as as i guess settlers uh and colonialists uh, start to move west right what is the genesis of this sort of lack of awareness i mean it, it, and maybe maybe this is like a generic um, shyness about being an empire, but it, it doesn't, you know, like it seems to me like the British Empire was sort of, you know, they were pretty uh, psyched about making sure that everybody was aware <laughs> that they were an empire. I don't yeah. get the same, yeah. the, the, you don't get the same sense of, of American history in that way. Yeah. So two things. First of all, um, you're right that in some ways these questions of empire go back to day one, uh, literally to day one, in that the uh, right after the United States is formally independent from Britain, so the treaty has been ratified by both sides and now the country is independent, uh, its, its name is United States of America, which suggests that it's a union of states, but it's not. 
It's a union of, or it's not even a union, it's an amalgam of states and territories. The word union suggests voluntarily entered into. Uh, but the United States, from day one, has territories, uh, in this case, Western territories, uh, and will have territories every day, you know, until now. I mean, so every every intervening day, it's 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 always states and territories. Um, but at first, that's a not a hidden kind of thing about the United States. People are very aware of it. The Civil War has a lot to do with the battle for slavery in the territories. Um, you know, candidates for president will talk about their sort of you know log cabin, you know, backcountry roots. I think the moment when the uh, imperial architecture of the United States becomes the kind of thing that has to be hidden uh, is when those territories are no longer uh, receptacles for the filling up with white settlers, uh, when they become large populous places uh, full of people who are perceived from the perspective of the mainland as non-white uh, and who can't just be dislodged by um, white settlers. And so th we're talking here about uh, territories like Puerto Rico, Hawaii, the Philippines, Alaska, Guam, uh, and that kind of imperialism, the kind about you're know, ruling distant populations, uh, the kind that Britain does so proudly, that's the kind that the United States never sort of, or very rarely trumpets proudly, and, and for most of its history experiences a, a sort of cognitive dissonance about, uh, you know, on the one hand, it has a vision of itself as, you know, a republic uh, where everyone has sort of some say in the government. On the other hand, the reality is that, you know, millions of people uh, live under this different kind of government. And that never quite fits in the same way that it fits easily into British political culture. Is that what it is? It's because that that reality um, butts up against the 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 I guess the the narrative of the character of of America, of the idea of America. And, and, and is it is it that and or is it also that um we're this is about resource extraction or about some type of like we need a base here well yeah it's interesting that the the colonial the story of the united states overseas colonies is not largely a story of successful resource extraction uh there are sugar plantations and pineapple plantations and such uh but it's not like the united states depends for its absolute livelihood on its overseas territories it does in the later 20th century start to care a lot about um you know all of its military bases all over the planet uh but but why does it have large colonies it doesn't really it turn out to need them in some deep way. Um, nevertheless, there is a, there's a real contradiction between how the United States, which was born of an anti-colonial revolt, envisions itself, the kind of pattern that, had, that it had been in, in the 19th century, where it did, you know, states and territories, but it always, you know, or it, it intended to upgrade those territories to states once they were filled with large white populations. And then the kind of pattern that, you know, it acts out in the overseas territories, which doesn't quite fit that model and therefore um, doesn't, you know, can't be part of the sort of, uh, or, or doesn't turn out to be part of the national myth of the country. I, I want to go through, start going through the history, but, but, uh, but, uh, but I'm sort of hung up on like, what, so why was there so much of this? <laughs> like, what did we... Well, so much of what? Of, of that, of, 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 main, of maintenance of territories. When we don't need the resources, was it we need the markets? Was it the... the I mean, because I know, you know, we have some dynamics where it's, you know, it gives us a little like... It, it's almost like Guantanamo Bay on some level that is a little bit extreme, but that's a model of what we use these territories for. Like it's outside of the purview of the United States, but we still have control so we can experiment with some stuff and maybe do stuff yeah, that's, yeah. you know, quasi legal, that type of thing. Well, so Guantanamo Bay is a pretty good example of this because, you know, now we think of Guantanamo Bay as, for the perspective of you know the United States and the national security apparatus, it has been a very useful space. It's this little part of Cuba that the United States has exclusive jurisdiction over, and jurisdiction that is so complete it's as if it were a sovereign, but it's not a sovereign. And that difference between not quite technically being a sovereign is what allows all kinds of legal things to happen or things that would be illegal if they were happening on U.S. soil. Uh, so you think of that as a very useful kind of space, but you have to realize that the United States had had Guantanamo Bay since the very early 20th century. 
And, you know, sometimes it had been it had been genuinely really useful. Other times it had been a little less so. And there's a kind of history of experimentation. What can be done with it? Uh, Haitians who are, you know, coming to the U.S. mainland can be detained there. That's something that happens before it, it gets its, its present day use. Um, and I think there, a lot of the history of the U.S. colonial empire, as opposed to the history of the pointillist empire and the military bases, um, is a history of speculative speculative desires. Uh, but desires that don't always pan out. So there's this great enthusiasm at the end of the 19th century for the United States becoming a big colonial empire, for having Hawaii and the Philippines, and these will be uh, you know, highways to Asia and to trade with Japan and China. And that trade doesn't really become a huge thing. Uh, but nevertheless, in the same way that you can, you know, a couple can fall out of love but stay married, uh, a country can grow less imperialist or sort of lose its initial imperialist desire and, and remain an empire. And I think that's the history of, of the U.S. colonies, at least in the early 20th century. Um, they're, you know, they, they do have some kinds of uses for Washington, uh, but they are not the most useful parts of the country. Nevertheless, they're still part of it and a part of the country that is neglected that lives in the shadows. Um, well, that could be a very weird part of the country to occupy. Uh, tell us a little bit uh, how like the Guano Islands um, um, oh, fall into yes, that, please. and that notion of appertaining, um, yeah. uh, the, it, which I found fascinating. Yeah, so what happens is there's an uh, agricultural crisis in the United States in the mid-19th century, and uh, the reason it's happening is, is you know, kind of fairly predictable, is that uh, if you grow food uh, on a farm, again, you grow a cash crop. So it could be grain, it could be cotton, it could be tobacco. But if you grow it again and again on the same plot of land and you keep selling it somewhere else, selling it somewhere else rather than consuming it nearby or consuming it on the land and then depositing the nutrients back in the land uh, through feces or just you know by putting the waste back on the land, uh, you end up depleting the soil. And particularly, you start running down uh, the soil's uh, nitrates, which are kind of hard to restore if you just keep you know, doing that year after year. Uh, so farmers get really nervous about finding some way to uh, replenish their parched farms. And the thing that does it is guano, which is um, – guano can mean bird or bat feces used for fertilizer. But it turns out that this is the droppings of seabirds on these small – dry islands that don't see a lot of rain, where the birds just land and, you know, uh, they, they eat their anchovies and they land on the islands uh, and then they defecate on the islands. And then it just, you know, it just keeps piling up for years, centuries, millennia, drying in the sun. That stuff is a really useful fertilizer. And so in the middle of the 19th century, this is actually the first U.S. overseas expansion, uh, the United States lays claim to nearly 100 uninhabited guano islands and annexes them to the United States. And there's a Guano Island Act that's passed, and it says that these places will be, once they're sort of claimed and the claim is ratified, uh, they'll be appertaining to the United States, uh, which is a kind of a weird sort of language. But what it seems to say is that they're, they're fully part of the United States. Uh, now, that just that phrase, appertaining to the United States, uh, that's the legal foundation for the United States' overseas empire. That's the first time that the United States had annexed overseas territory. And there's a Supreme Court case about whether appertaining really – does that mean that this, these places are really part of the United States or not? And the Supreme Court decides yes. So uh, it's, a, it's you know, these just – you know, a hundred small uninhabited islands. They're quickly scraped free of guano. And then after that, they're not as useful anymore. Uh, but nevertheless, they are the, uh, the actual legal foundations for a much larger populous empire. Um, you know, one that includes, you know, up to 19 million people by the uh, eve of World War II. It's an amazing metaphor that our, our, our yeah. entire uh, <laughs> empire, uh, uh, the, the project of the empire, is literally built on mountains of crap. But yeah, uh, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. And, and I'll just say one other thing, because we talked about the ways in which these, these places can be useful and then not have an obvious use from the perspective of Washington, but, you know, sort of develop one a little later. Uh, those guano islands, after the uh, guano is scraped off of them, uh, they sort of fall into disrepair or disuse. But then it turns out in the mid 20th century, for all of the reasons that they're interesting to birds as places to land, they're also really useful for places for airplanes to land. And then suddenly the guano islands become absolute, or at least some of them become absolutely essential to the U.S. military strategy. And it is with the guano islands that the United States fights World War II in the Pacific. 
Interesting. And let's talk about let's move to the um, uh, the early 1900s when the Supreme Court does sort of make a distinction between uh, incorporated and unincorporated territories. What were the implications of that and what how how, how much staying power did that have? Yeah, so it's a really interesting moment. So the United States has just acquired a number of populated territories. It's gutted Spain's empire in a war, and it's also taken Hawaii and American Samoa. And then there's this legal question of, well, what are these places? Are they part of the United States? And if so, how much are they part of the United States? Uh, you know, are people who live in them automatically citizens? There's a law. It's called the 14th Amendment that says if you're born in the United States, you're a U.S. citizen. Does that apply to Filipinos? Does the rest of the does the Bill of Rights apply to Filipinos? Uh, so the Supreme Court argues it, and it's a, it's a contested thing. It's a it's a very public thing. Uh, these, these arguments, and uh, ultimately, what the Supreme Court decides is that uh, there is a distinction, and it, this is a novel distinction. It wasn't one that had been around before, but the Supreme Court introduces it. There's a distinction between incorporated territories. Those territories are part of the United States in a constitutional sense. So those are the old Western territories. And they're also the two overseas territories that have the largest white populations, Hawaii and the Supreme Court decides Alaska. But all of the territories that the United States had claimed from Spain, which is where most of its colonial subjects live, those the Supreme Court decides are unincorporated territories, which means that they are part of the United States, but they're not part of the United States that's covered by the Constitution. Uh, and so that's why, even today, you can be born in American Samoa. Uh, you're born in the United States. No one disputes that. You have a U.S. passport. The stars and flags, uh, stars and stripes fly overhead. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, your U.S. passport does not say you're a U.S. citizen because the 14th Amendment doesn't extend to you. Uh, you're a U.S. national instead. I mean, the... To put it in context, this is the same Supreme Court that basically said literacy uh, laws for voting were OK and uh, poll taxes were OK. I mean, the 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 agenda is pretty clear, right? Yeah. yeah and it's actually uh, nearly identical to the court. I mean, there's, I think, one member different uh, that. Uh, decides the first of these cases, they're called the Insular Cases, uh, that also decides Plessy v. Ferguson, which is the case that enshrines separate uh, but equal as a you know, constitutional way of running the country, which administratively divides the country into two in terms of uh, white and non-white. Uh, the Insular Cases do something similar. They divide the uh, country into two in terms of a constitutional zone and an extra-constitutional zone, and they also do it appealing to exactly the same logic you know, who's really part of the country and who's, for racial reasons, not quite really part of the country. The difference is this. Plessy v. Ferguson, I mean, that's recognized today as one of the sort of worst mistakes in the court's history, and it's been overturned. The insular cases are still good law. Yeah, well, I mean, Plessy v. Ferguson, we could be just a couple of years away from uh, from that uh, from that type of regime returning in some respects. But maybe I'm overstating the case maybe a little bit, but... Uh, uh, certainly the Lochner era may be back uh, soon. But um, with that said, um, so this law, the, 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 this, so how is it that, well, I mean, I guess it's, it's quite obvious why it's so durable, right? Is because, well, wh why has that been so durable, I guess, is, is really what I'm asking. Uh, like why, yeah. wh wh what were the forces that didn't allow Plessy v. Ferguson to stand, but, but allowed this to stand? Yeah, I think one difference is that um, the uh, Jim Crow was uh, it was a obviously a form of racist subordination, but it was also fairly public. Uh, you know, it was hard to not know that the country had a Jim Crow system uh, if you were living anywhere in the country uh, in the 20th century. Uh, nevertheless, it's been very easy not to really understand uh, the colonial system or even the fact of overseas territories if you live in the mainland part of the United States or if you have lived there in the 20th uh, and into the 21st century. So an example of this is even after Hurricane Maria hit uh, Puerto Rico and you know laid waste to the infrastructure of the island, uh, there was a, you know, and it made all the headlines, uh, there was a national poll that asked people uh, in the mainland, are Puerto Ricans U.S. citizens? And barely a majority of people, adults polled, were able to correctly say, yes, Puerto Ricans are U.S. citizens. And if you asked um, adults under 30, 
only 37% of them were able to uh, cough up that number. So I think one difference between the um, racist regime uh, that had applied to uh, African Americans is it was very much in the public view, whereas uh, the colonial forms of subordination and segregation, um, those, have, those have kind of happened off stage, uh, at least off stage from the perspective of the mainland. Uh, since we're talking about Puerto Rico, uh, tell us the story of uh, Cornelius Rhodes, because that is, um, you know, we've talked on this program, uh, you know, that um, of, of the long history that the United States has had that in many respects is really um, um, one of, you know, uh, almost waging some type of war against Puerto Rico in one form or another. Uh, and Cornelius Rhodes, I think, sort of exemplifies that a little bit. Yeah, so I said that the uh, you know overseas parts of the United States are often off stage from the perspective of the mainland. And what's important to grasp is that all kinds of things can happen off stage that couldn't happen under the glare of the spotlights. And the Cornelius Rhodes story is a great example of that. So Cornelius Rhodes is a doctor. He's Harvard trained. Uh, he's from the mainland. But he goes to San Juan, he goes to Puerto Rico, and he goes there to study anemia, with a, a, um, a condition from which many uh, Puerto Ricans suffer. And so what does he do? Well, suddenly, this, you know, when he hits the island, he just becomes a very different kind of doctor. Uh, so first of all, he intentionally refuses treatment to some of his patients just to see what will happen. Uh, he tries to induce disease in other of his patients also to see what will happen. He describes patients such as this to his colleagues as experimental animals. Uh, and then he writes a letter. He writes one of the most extraordinary letters that I've read as a historian, uh, where he writes to a colleague, to a Boston colleague, and he you know, starts off, it's a very chatty letter, and he said, um, you know, how are you? Hope everyone's well. Well, here's some gossip about the field. And then he says, oh, and me, Puerto Rico, you know, I'm in Puerto Rico. It's beautiful. The island is great. Uh, the only problem is the Puerto Ricans. They're awful. They're filthy. They steal. Uh, frankly, they're, they're the worst. And uh, the best thing for Puerto Rico, he goes on to say, would be a total extermination of the population. And then he says, in fact, I've started it. I have killed eight of my patients and I've tried to transplant cancer. Turns out it's very hard to transplant cancer, but he doesn't know that. Uh, I've tried to transplant cancer into 13 others. Uh, you know, hope your wife's well, uh, all, all best. And, and it's, it's an incredible letter, right? Because he just confessed to, it seems like he's confessed to murdering eight people. Uh, and extraordinarily, the letter gets found by the Puerto Rican hospital staff, and it becomes a major scandal in Puerto Rico. Of course it does. Uh, there's, a, there's an investigation by the government. Uh, that the investigation uncovers yet another letter, which the government, uh, the governor describes as worse than the first, which is kind of impossible to imagine for me. Uh, but nevertheless, the government uh, destroys that second letter, so we've never seen it as historians, uh, and, and concludes that he wasn't really serious about what he said. He didn't really kill eight people. Uh, and extraordinarily, Cornelius Rhodes is able to just leave. He doesn't face any kind of trial. He, just, he doesn't even lose his job. Uh, he just goes back to the mainland. What happens in San Juan stays in San Juan. Uh, and then his medical career takes off. Uh, now, it does. I mean, what's amazing about the story is that in itself would be incredible, but it doesn't end because uh, as his medical career takes off, he becomes the vice president of the New York Academy of Medicine. He goes into the army, and while he's in the army, he oversees a or he's the chief medical officer in a large-scale series of uh, tests of chemical weapons on U.S. service members. So U.S. service members are, have uh, toxic agents applied to their skin to see what happens. Many of them suffer permanent damage. They're put in gas chambers with gas masks to see what will happen. Uh, some of them are put out in jungles and told to fight while they're gassed from overhead. A lot of those people are also Puerto Rican. And Cornelius Rhodes is right there in the middle of it, writing up reports. Does black skin blister differently than white skin? Cornelius Rhodes will let you know. Uh, you know, he gets a medal for this. Uh, and then as a result of those experiments, uh, he, one of the things they figure out is that some of these um, toxic agents are actually good at fighting cancer. And Cornelius Rhodes uses that to uh, become in the third phase of his career, the first head of the Sloan Kettering Institute, uh, and basically one of the pioneers of chemotherapy. And that's what he's remembered for for decades on the U.S. mainland as a medical hero, the, you know, the father of chemotherapy. And it really takes an extraordinarily long time before Puerto Ricans are able to get the message out that this guy who's been on the cover of Time magazine as a hero 
is actually the sort of like Mengele of Puerto Rico. Uh, and, and I mean, for me, that's that's kind of the, the, the that's the final extraordinary bit is that the informational segregation is so tight uh, that it takes decades for Puerto Ricans to effectively, uh, you know, do something about the fact that Cornelius Rose is being celebrated, openly celebrated as a hero on the mainland. Uh, and the people who are celebrating him have no idea what he was up to in Puerto Rico. Uh, that that story is just so nuts, um, man. But it it really yeah, it does really is. it does capture. I mean, it is it's almost the perfect metaphor in some respects, right? I mean, that is um, the the extraction or the uh, the oppression ends up, you know, fueling on some level at different times um, uh, the expansion and the, the you know, the success uh, uh, of the country in some fashion. Um, and then, um, you know, we don't have too much time left here, but it w- the, the, the nature of the empire changes to being um, less colonial and, and in many respects more like, um, like, would you call it, Sort of through, via influence, or I mean, maybe the 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 Hoover uh, screws story sort of is is a good metaphor for this. Yeah, so I think there are two things that happen um, uh, as the United States, you know, gets through World War II, it becomes the most powerful country in the world. And it has the option militarily. I mean, it, it physically can do this. It has the option of uh, doing what Britain had done, which is expressing its power by taking a lot of colonies and controlling a lot of the land of the planet. Right at the end of World War II, the United States actually has, in occupied zones mainly, uh, and in in colonies, which is a a slightly lesser number, it has more people who are under U.S. jurisdiction, uh, who are uh, living outside of the mainland, than who are living in all of the states. I mean, that's how much land the United States briefly controls at the end of World War II. And so then it faces an interesting question. Is, does, is it want to be Britain again? Does it want to sort of do that whole thing and, and claim colonies and annex Japan and all that kind of stuff? And it doesn't. Uh, and, you know, it still has a colonial empire. They, there are still five inhabited territories of the United States today, and millions of people live in them. Uh, but nevertheless, the United States sort of pivots away. Uh, one thing is it does is it seeks to find ways to um, influence outside of its borders, uh, to extend its and project power, not by extending its borders, by annexing new places, but by controlling processes in foreign countries. Uh, but undergirding that, and this is what I focus on particularly, uh, is that the United States does this not by abjuring territory entirely, but by claiming just a bunch of small territorial points. Uh, And by a bunch, I mean literally hundreds. That's the number of foreign military bases that the United States has. But these points act as sort of staging grounds and beacons uh, and and just little uh, sort of uh, connectors that allow the United States to spread a much more diffuse influence out throughout the world, uh, which is still undergirded by some sort of territorial component, um, but a territorial footprint that I think looks more pointillist than colonial. I mean, it's almost like um, it's almost like the like the web, like a series of servers. We have something like uh, nearly 800 uh, bases across the country. I mean, across the world. Yeah, um, it's a network, uh, right? Um, and, and wh- how does that, is that, is that, is, is the, the influence there exclusively, um, uh, is it projecting power from a military standpoint? Like these are, you know, we have the high ground in these 800 places or, 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 or we have control of, you know, it need be, you know, the Harbor, or is it also a, um, a, a cultural one too? Yes, what's I, what I think is so interesting about the bases is that their purpose is military. That's what they're there for. That's why we call them military bases. Uh, but that's not all they do, because you have to imagine these places as little, or in some cases actually not so little, enclaves that are full of people from the United States. And there's all kind of interesting contacts between people on the base, often who have quite a lot of money compared to the uh, surrounding region and the people around it. So in the book, I tell the story about the complicated interactions that people who are on base have with folks who are living in the shadow of the bases. Uh, and it actually becomes a really important vector for the spread of U.S. culture. So one of the questions I take up in my book is, why does Liverpool 
become this sort of world city of pop. Like, why is there so much? We know about the Beatles, but, you know, the, like the bench is like 500 bands deep. There's a lot of, you know, bands that like were pointed in the direction of the Beatles. You know, we're doing that kind of music and they're all coming out of the Liverpool area. And why is that? Uh, because Liverpool hadn't habitually been uh, the major city for pop music uh, in Britain. And the answer is that, you know, Liverpool is in the shadow of the single largest U.S. Air Force base in Europe, uh, a space called Burtonwood. And it's really clear that not just the Beatles, but all these other bands are kind of subsisting on, well, I mean, you know, these guys in the base who are very rich, who are going out into the clubs at night, who are demanding U.S. style rock uh, and, you know, Ringo's stepdad works on the base, makes his money there, and gets all these records as a result of working there that he gives to Ringo. Uh, John's mom is a, what's called a good time girl, so she, I imagine she's spending some time with the guys from the bases. She also has an incredibly up to date record collection, uh, and that's that's how Paul gets his records too. Uh, and George sort of steals them from the local record shop, which is also bristling with all kinds of like really good what they then called race records, which are African American uh, records of African American music, and all of that's coming from the poor portal of the base where there's just all this money there's all this glamour and there are all these guys sort of you know waiting to spread it around for willing young teenagers who can play u.s style rock so it's not entirely surprised that the liverpool area becomes an area sort of where rock takes off uh because these bases are you know in some ways little just portals of the united states and little portals not just of u.s military power but of u.s uh, you know, industrial standards and, and, and culture and, and all in language and all these other things that come with the United States that seep through the portal as well. Well, it's, it's fascinating stuff. I wish we had uh, more time to get to, um, the, uh, the, the standardization of, of screws, screws which I dread. found fascinating and, uh, longtime listeners of, uh, of, of this program will remember the story of the Northern Mariana Islands and Jack Abramoff and Tom DeLay and uh, how they would yeah. visit that in the mid-aughts um, as a way of basically getting um, made in USA uh, goods uh, by basically near slave labor, practically. But um, there's, there's a lot more in here. How to Hide an Empire, a History of the Greater United States. Daniel Imavart, thank you so much for your time today. We will put a link at majority.fm of your book. Thanks so much. It's been a pleasure to be on. All right, folks. Uh, this is Max. I'm calling in from uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Max from Minneapolis, Minnesota. What's on your mind, Max? Well, a lot of things right now, actually. I think I emailed you guys the other night. I said I was asking about uh, whether or not you guys still did the uh, whole uh, debate, the, uh, what was it, libertarian anarcho-capitalist thing. Uh, sure. Sure. So wh what yeah. do you got? Uh, whatever you got to throw at me. Uh, people have asked me why I'm an anarcho-capitalist, why I think this is a good ideology, why I like it so much. Okay, okay. can I just say uh, you before can... you start, you cannot have both of our words at once. You have to choose one. Either you're going to take anarchist or libertarian from us, from the far left, I mean. No, you can do whatever uh, no. you want. You, you can do whatever you want. You can explain to us now. All right, so... Um, what, uh, okay. So you, wh why don't you explain to us what, uh, what these are? What is a, what is a libertarian anarcho capitalist? Well, it's where somebody is allowed to have the freedom of the state to whatever means necessary. And someone can just basically do whatever they want in a organized boundary where they're not allowed to let anybody in or anybody out without any sort of regulation. Okay, what's the um, who, who's going to organize this uh, these boundaries? The hierarchical society. And how is that hierarchical society that is stateless now? How is that going to work? Well, it's capitalist. It's one of the few things carried over from a capitalist society. So it's so it's um, so the one thing that so so what you imagine is that basically our leaders will be the richest people in the country and they will organize things for us. This, that's, that's what capitalism is. It's anarchy in wherein people are allowed to buy whatever they want at whatever asking price they are asking for. It's basically a haggling system as you can have in say the diasporas or the, you know, cities in Israel. When I went there, it was, you know, you would say, I want in the shook, uh, in the shook. 
Yes, like that. You know, the markets, the, the bazaars. When you would go there, you could ask, you know, they would ask 500 shekels for uh, a soccer jersey, and you could say, well, I want to pay 350. And you could right. start haggling from there. You could say, well, I want, you could say 475 for like 450. No, I you understand, I understand that how haggling society. works. And no, so wait a second. So, so in the society you imagine, Max, uh, what, what if the richest person, right? Let's say, cause, cause you know, as we transition into your version of the society, right? Like the, the capitalists who have all the money, they're going to be the ones who organize everything. Correct. As you said, they're going to be the, the organizers, uh, because they're, this is a, the hierarchical society that you're talking about. What if, uh, they yeah, say absolutely. like, Hey guys, I have a billion dollars. Guess what? I just bought the uh, shook and all you little guys. Bye bye. And now Max goes in to bargain with this one owner and he says, um, I want that uh, soccer jersey. And the guy says, 500 shekels. And Max says, ah, I want to pay 300 shekels. And the guy says, all right, goodbye. Good luck buying it somewhere else because we've cornered the whole thing. Well, I. <laughs> And yeah, I could just buy it somewhere else. It's not. No, no, I'm, I'm, Max. I just said they've bought it all up. They've they've bought out every other little stall that's there. Those little tiny stalls, they they couldn't compete with this billionaire. So where do you get the shirt now, Max? You buy it anywhere else, I guess. Well, I just I just told you there's no other there's no other stores. He's got a monopoly. Max, hmm? you still there? Yeah, I'm here. So, dude, what 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 do you do? I'm just listening to the people in the background. What's up? Well, those guys. You have a wonderful day, bro, and I'll see you again soon. <laughs> no, no, for, uh, for, forgive Michael, please. He is rude. He is rude. I but, got but, something but in my eyes. It's nothing to do with this. Listen, I'm not listening. Believe me. What, I'm, I, Max? <laughs> I'm asking you, what do you do now? Well, then, you know, well, I can, well, one, I could either revolt. I could shut down his market. I could try How are you going to shut down his market? Could, He's got a billion dollars. You, you got what? 150 bucks? You got the 300 I could shekels? Overthrow it. That's the beauty of an anarchistic society. I could throw it over. But how, Stop using our word that's not <laughs> your second. word. Wait a second. How would you throw over are that? You, that, oh my. What do you mean, oh my God? Anarchistic is not like. Uh, you're saying anarchy. Hold on, you, uh, you you're claiming anarchy as a word. As a, no, as no, no. Like right, listen, don't get distracted by no, that. No, no, don't no, get no, distracted. no, 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 no. <laughs> you you can't you can't just claim a word like that. This, this right. isn't no, this isn't like you're like right. Politics. You're right. She <laughs> cannot. I agree. Now let's get back to the scenario we were talking about. Um, let's say like like how would you overthrow let's say Bloomberg News? Just assassinate the guy. Oh, okay. I I understand that. <laughs> I understand what you're saying now. So this is going to lead in your anarcho-capitalist uh, world. The way it's going to work is uh, monopolies and then assassinations. Yeah. All right. Cool world, man. Do we get jetpacks? No. I didn't think so. All right, buddy. Oh I appreciate the call. Thank such, you. Such appropriation. It's really, it's really triggering for me. <laughs> All right. Remember, folks, and caps or whatever you want to call yourselves. It's a culture, not a costume. This is not beanbag. <laughs> Anarchists <laughs> oppose hierarchy. The more you know. Stop it. Knock it off. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I now, listen. By the way, listen. no. To be fair, can I just say? most legit answer to that question i've ever heard right i, I mean, mean everybody else is just like oh, i go and i ask them maybe they want to be we could have a free exchange of ideas assassinate them okay i will say it's not what i want but that I will was say, by far also, the most intelligent answer i've heard to that and question. that's and that's why i had to basically wrap up the conversation uh because i 
really don't have a response to someone who is suggesting we can develop a political system that would be based on monopolies that would be uh, dealt with by assassination. I mean, that is, I, I can't really argue. You're cornered. Right. You're cornered. I, you know, like, it's if, like agree to disagree on what kind of world you want. Exactly. Um, if we're not, um, 500 shekels, eh? <laughs> Watch your back at the souk. Oh, shoot. It's hard I to argue if, when you can't agree we on the basic uh, less, terms. Uh, less uh, concerned about the direction of that conversation, it would have been really like, how do you go about organizing the assassinations when all of the private Here's, death squads are owned by the same billionaires? Well, I'll tell you how, how you do, do you that. How do you get to the assassinations when there are no roads? Nice. That's how you do it. You get nice. born to do it. Wait, so then Jason Bourne is operating as some type of like social service worker for people that aren't billionaires. That doesn't sound very capitalist. Lit exactly. He is the one. That's the one thing you need is the pro bono social services top assassin spy. So then they can see like, I will concede even though I'm a libertarian, we need a government provision for one thing, which is a Jason Bourne style assassination <laughs> squad. Service. Squad. Sort of like the Jedi, but not so futuristic. <laughs> It sounds lit. That's actually pretty awesome, dude. That, that mean, was the that was the best libertarian call I've ever had. Respect. That was. It. I mean, there you go. So apparently, there's this uh, uh, pastor, Kenneth Copeland. He is a mega church uh, pastor. Why would Inside Edition be interested in this? Well, apparently, uh, Kevin uh, Kenneth Copeland. Who did he buy his uh, plane from? He bought his his plane from Tyler Perry, which is a I don't know. If you're worried about demons, apparently the the uh, the preacher said, someone asked him about it. He said, I'm not getting on board of one of those metal tubes with all the devils, little devils. In there. <laughs> and uh, you'll see in this um, sort of interview, if you will, he, he's, he explains it's not humans I'm talking about. I'm talking about actual devil spirits. I, I gotta be. I, I would be worried about getting into Tyler uh, 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 Tyler Perry's plane. Yeah, can you imagine getting on a private jet with this guy? Yeah, no. He's this not is... talking about white devils, that's for sure. Oh, there you go. All right, so here, here is uh, here is uh, mega church pastor Kenneth Copeland being uh, interviewed by a Inside Edition reporter. Isn't it true that you want to fly commercial so that you can fly in luxury? How much money did you pay for Tyler Perry's Gulfstream jet, for example? Well, for example, that's really none of your business, but... Isn't it the business of your donors? Listen, I paid. <laughs> you kind of caught me off guard here, okay? <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Help me. Just let me, let me pray. Well, let me, let me just ask you a really simple question. A lot of people think it's unbecoming for a preacher to live a life of luxury and to fly around in private jets. What's your response to that? Very simple. It takes a lot of money to do what we do. Without the airplane that we have that I bought from Tyler Perry, and I didn't pay anywhere. And Tyler's one of the greatest guys. He made it... He made that airplane so cheap for me, I couldn't help but buy it. Well, my question then, well, well, okay, all right, but I want to get to the demons, because people are very concerned about that comment. Give me a chance here, Inside Edition. Okay. I love your eyes. Again, getting back to the comment, you said that you don't like to fly commercial because you don't want to get into a tube with a bunch of demons. Do you really believe that human beings are demons? No, I do not. And don't you ever say I did. We wrestle not with flesh and blood, but principalities and powers. Can and you explain what you meant by that, yes. that, by that term then? Yes. Just, just explain, because it's really simple. You said you didn't want to get into a tube with a bunch of demons. What did you mean? Do you think that Let people that fly commercial are demons? You give me a chance to talk, sweetheart. I'll explain this to you. But it's a biblical thing. It's a spiritual thing. It doesn't have anything to do with people. People, I love people. Jesus loves people. Jesus but does. people get pushed in alcohol. Do you think that's a good place for a preacher to be and prepare to go preach to a lot of people 
when somebody in there is dragging some woman down an aisle. It, it made me so mad to see that on television. I wanted to punch the guy out myself. I can't be doing that while I'm getting ready to preach. So you just don't like to be around the sinful people or the, the hurtful people. Is that what you're saying? Not the people, baby. Not the people. <laughs> God. To those critics that say <laughs> that a preacher should not be living a life of luxury, what is your response to that? They're wrong. That's it. The Bible also says that it's more difficult for a rich man to get into heaven than it is for a camel to get through the eye of a needle, correct? The rest of the scripture. But he said, all things are possible with God. Boom! There you go! Owned. I love it when he goes, I bet that's not right, baby. He's calling her baby like that's... I like your ass. Oh, my God. That is so creepy. How many... How many, like, inappropriate... Like, 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 ah. He's trying to shut I'm, her up. I mean, aside from just the, the, the horror that those type of people are, just broadly speaking... How many? How many do you think like inappropriate sort of come ons he's he's been involved in? Like how, how many? Like God, seems like a lot. I felt very uh, grateful that she had the door between uh, yeah. him and her. But I will say this: what I would like to see inside edition, uh, the business they get into, is why stop with preachers? Yes. Like, why is there? Um, really a fundamental difference that uh, it's hypocritical for a man of God to amass that kind of money uh, when it's okay for Howard Schultz to. Well, I mean, Howard Schultz doesn't claim to be super into Jesus, does he? Well, he's Jewish. All right, so. Like, uh, there is a certain hypocrisy and. I think that's probably true, but I still think that like sometimes I sort of feel like those type of things get to be a little bit like they're a little bit distracting. That's the only thing I'm saying. Fair enough. Going after religion. Nobody should have a private jet. I think private jets are a problem. Yeah, we should ban private jets. It'd be great. Um, fly with demons the way the rest of us do. <laughs> Demon Airlines. You think you're too good to fly with demons? Dude, we all think we fly with demons. We know that. Yeah, no. I don't know. The way you talked about that offer of the private jet, are we sure Tyler Perry isn't like a discount private jet salesman? Or something? It was so cheap. I had to buy, I had it. To buy it for the church. <laughs> My God. I'm going to flip it. I'm going to flip it. It's only a quarter of a million dollars. I'm not going to I got that. news for you. That jet was probably more, a little more than a quarter of a million dollars. Well, I'm going to start an airline called know, Demon I... Air and <laughs> all of the goth socialists who, you know, listen to my show are going to fly on it. It's going to be great. I'm going to start a religion. Speaking of. <laughs> I, meanwhile, on the Hill yesterday, the uh, House Judiciary Committee heard testimony from former White House counsel John Dean, who was obviously uh, Richard Nixon's. White House counsel um, went on to write extensively about uh, Nixon and about uh, authoritarians in our government. That was 10, 15 years ago. He saw that the Republican Party was actually turning authoritarian. Um, saw the indications of that happening. And he's been, uh, you know, brought on various uh, capacities as a... Uh, as a commentator, I'm not sure I fully get why. I, I understand the sort of the thinking, but it really is one dimensional thinking and uh, clever, too clever by half, I think, by the Democrats to do this. Uh, but it may be the best that they could do with Nancy Pelosi. And we will talk about Nancy Pelosi. We have that clip of her, Pete Peterson. Right? Oh, God. Anyways, um, so in lieu of. Uh, of impeachment hearings, we're getting this, which is uh, apparently just to set the table. Now, of course, it, it did create some attention. And wherever there's attention, there is uh, milkshake Matt Getz. Um, Matt Getz loves a, 
a, a slushy on a hot uh, Florida day. He is uh, from the uh, Florida Panhandle. And um, here he is uh, questioning John Dean. He doesn't do a terribly good job, but he does get humiliated. And how do we know that Matt Gates felt he got humiliated? I will tell you after the clip. Do you have personal knowledge regarding the truth or falsity of a single material fact in the Mueller report? I, I think if you recall the first thing I said, I'm not here as a fact witness. You're here to provide historical context. Exactly. And throughout history, you accuse presidents of acting like Richard Nixon and you make money off of it, right? Not all presidents, no. No, but a few more Those than Those who do act like him, I pointed out. Let me ask you this question. How do Democrats plan to pay for Medicare for all? I'm sorry? How do, well, I figured if we were going to ask you about stuff you don't know about, we'd start with the big stuff. So do you know how they plan to pay for Medicare for all? Uh, who? The Democrats or which candidate or can well, you be more specific? Let's get specific to Nixon since that appears to be why you're here. Do you believe? Well, actually, Nixon did have a health care plan. <laughs> Good. Good. Well, do you believe if we if we turned the lights off here and maybe lit some candles, got out a Ouija board, we could potentially raise the specter of Richard Nixon? <laughs> I, I doubt that. Well, it, it so now um, sounded much better in front of the mirror, Matt. Right, Matt Gates <laughs> thought he was, yeah, and basically he he tried like three or four different tacks. I'm going to go to this. Oh, oh, John Dean actually may actually know how these uh, candidates are going to pay for their health care, and I certainly don't want that to happen. So let's talk about Nixon. Oh, Nixon had a health care. And they all laughed at Matt Gates. And what's even more important than my assessment that they all laughed at Matt Gates is Matt Gates's assessment that they laughed at Matt Gates. And how do I know that Matt Gates felt they all laughed at uh, him? Because there is no intern in Matt Gates' office who would have made the decision on their own to edit that video and release it and hide the fact that John Dean owned Matt Gates in this uh, exchange. Here is the video that has been put out by Matt Gates. This is eerie, folks. Eerie. 50,000 people have watched this and they're missing the part where Matt Gates gets metaphorically slushied. How they plan to pay for Medicare for all? Uh, who? The Democrats or which candidate or can well, you be more specific? Let's get specific to Nixon since that appears to be why you're here. If we turned the lights off here and maybe lit some candles, got out a Ouija board, we could potentially raise the specter of Richard Nixon. <laughs> there you go. They cut out that whole moment. They made it sound as if people were chuckling at his weak joke. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they, yeah because they got the tail end of the laughter. Here's the part again. It appears to be why you're here. If we turn the lights off here. Specific? Let's get specific to Nixon, since that appears to be why you're here. If we turn the lights off. Yeah. Orwellian, man. Let's get specific to skipping me humiliating myself in a spectacular fashion. Calling Vic Berger. I'm well, that forget Vic Berger. This, is, this should be all over the news in Florida. I yeah, mean, that's... that is pretty stunning. That he would edit it that way. Doctor in the public record. Yeah, it really is. And there's 50,000 people who watched his version already. 50,000 people, and you can bet a lot of those are his constituents.